Hi everyone, welcome to another video lecture for Kinesis 7103. In the video today, we're going to be building on the content from past models when we discuss how to deal with outliers in our data. So in the previous videos, we discussed having leverage residual outliers or influential data points as measured by something like Cook's distance. And those were very computational in terms of how we get those statistics. In this video, we want to be a little more philosophical in talking about how we want to deal with outliers and when it's appropriate to exclude them in different situations. So first, you know, we want to consider when should we ever remove outliers? And I, you know, ideally, there would be a, a hard line and some sort of cutoff where we can say exactly if outliers cross this threshold, right, they should always be removed. And if they don't cross that threshold, they should never be removed. But it's a lot more complicated than that. And often when we're dealing with outliers, we face tough questions about whether to include those data points or not. So these decisions are highly contextual. But in general, it's not appropriate to drop a data point simply because it is a statistical outlier. There has to be some other rationale that goes into the removal of that data point if we're going to exclude it from our analysis once it's been collected. So the reason why we do this, right, is because rare events or exceptional individuals are going to happen all the time. And if they truly belong in our sample, even though they might create some amount of skew or distortion in the data, they are representative of who we're trying to, you know, model in our statistical model. So we always have this push-pull between if it is an actual data point, right, it should be included because it's variability we want to try to explain. But if it's violating some assumptions or if it's driving uh, our statistical model, then that's going to be a problem. But ideally, we always want to have some other reason for why a data point should be excluded. So like I said, our sort of broad strokes rule is that it's not appropriate to drop a data point simply because it's an outlier. But, you know, like I said, this is also highly contextual. So in the next couple slides, I'm going to take you through three different sort of scenarios in which we have varying degrees of appropriateness for removal of these outliers. So in the first situation, uh, if it's an obvious that an outlier is due to some kind of error or comes from a totally different population, then it's safe to remove. But this removal should still be reported in your text, right? Across all these examples, we want transparent reporting. So any dropping of data uh, needs to be reported when you actually write this up for publication. So examples of this would be if we have some sort of biologically impossible value, right? So if we had a human VO2 max of 185, we know that's not physiologically possible. Um, therefore, we think there was maybe some sort of data entry error or some sort of recording error in our apparatus, and that data point should be excluded. Similarly, like if we notice that one person has much slower reaction times on average than everyone else or something, uh, and maybe but we go back and we check kind of our log notes in our lab notebook, and we find that, oh, well, a fire alarm went off during that data collection. Well, then that comes from an unusual event where that person is actually different from everyone else who was in your experiment. And so then that person could potentially be excluded uh, because they are, no, they are no longer actually subjected to the same experimental manipulation as everyone else. They were tested under fundamentally different conditions. They would be reasonable in that situation to exclude that outlier. Or the final case here would be if someone actually came from a fundamentally different population. So for example, if your sample is intended to be Parkinson's disease patients who are off their medication, but in the course of the study or after the study is concluded, you find out one of your participants was actually still on their medication, then this is a qualitatively different person, right, in terms of the populations that you're drawing from, and it would be appropriate to exclude that person. So in any of those situations, it's going to be completely legitimate to exclude those data points when you, when you run your statistical analysis analysis. But if we make any exclusions, as always, we want to be transparent in reporting them so everyone knows exactly how much data went into which analysis and who was excluded for what reasons. The second situation is if we have an outlier that does not change our result, right, in terms of really its magnitude or statistical significance, but it does affect our assumptions. In that situation, you're going to want to drop that outlier, but as always, its removal should be reported. So for instance, if you have an outlying data point that creates positive skew in your residuals, this might lead to a violation of our normality or our homoscedasticity assumptions. So if this data point doesn't really change your result one way or another, um, we actually probably want to report the result with that outlier excluded because our p-values are going to be more accurate the closer our assumptions are being to being maintained. Um, now, this could go a little bit one way or the other, right? So, for instance, if, it, if it's one data point out of 100, we probably want to err on the side of having those more accurate p-values and we'll drop that one data point. If there's like a larger set of outliers that are potentially causing this skew, um, we might not want to, you know, drop 
three people, right, or, or you know, certainly large proportions of our data just because it's going to give us better behaving residuals. So there is a little bit of a push-pull here, but this is going to be a situation in which it would probably be appropriate to drop like a single outlier or a small proportion of the data because it's going to give you residuals that better align with the assumptions of your statistical model, uh, and therefore your p-values are going to be more accurate and more reliable. Finally, in a more complicated situation, if an outlier affects our results and our assumptions, then we have to worry about exactly how this is happening. And this is why we like to look at the Cook's distance as a statistic and a measure of influence, because if a data point has a large Cook's distance value, that means it's fundamentally changing our model if it's included or if it's excluded. So in this situation, we want to consider kind of two different ways that this could work out. If that outlier is driving a result, which is to say when the outlier is excluded, there's no result. When the outlier is included, now there's a statistically significant result or association, then that outlier should be removed and the result should be reported without the outlier included. Because relationships that disappear when an outlier removed, is removed are not robust. So that would suggest that that's kind of a spurious result that's being driven by a single data point rather than the bulk of the data in our model. As an alternative, though, if an outlier affects the result uh, or, or association, uh, but it doesn't necessarily cause it to appear and disappear, it might be reasonable to run the analysis both with and without the influential data points. So ideally, again, there should be a compelling non-statistical reason for why those data points might be different and why we might want to consider including them or excluding them. Um, but if you do find yourself in this situation where you're testing the sensitivity of your analysis by running it two different ways, all analyses should be reported, and any differences in the analyses need to be emphasized. And hopefully we learn something about why including or excluding those rather unusual participants changed the, the, the result in the way that it did. So erring on the side of caution, we want to try to include all of the data, but we still want to reduce any disproportionate influence that a single data point might have on our statistical model. Right? And this is why we don't want to delete outliers unless we know that they are definitely an error. Um, so how can we retain data when, while meeting all of our assumptions if we're going to have outliers in there? So one of the things we have to consider is do we have the right statistical model? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next video, but when we talk about the families of generalized linear models, there are lots of different models that we can adopt, and not all of them assume a normal distribution of residuals, or they might have link functions that allow us to look at other types of, of uh, dependent variables. So we can actually uh, choose an approach that has statistically different assumptions, wherein that data point now is no longer violating our assumptions. If our assumptions are otherwise pretty much met, but one data point has some amount of influence or is a large outlier, a transformation of the outcome might also be an appropriate thing to consider. Now, that also comes with some trade-offs because essentially we're bending our data to fit our assumptions, right? Um, but there are going to be situations in which, you know, you, you know that given your outcome, you're using the appropriate sort of test uh, for, for your, your research question, um, but you want to make sure that your analysis is robust uh, so you might try, for instance, running it with the transformed and the untransformed data just to make sure that you get qualitatively similar results that agree. Um, so that would be a situation where you might consider you know, transforming the outcome in order to check the robustness of your results. However, in any, across any of these situations, if we find a result that's being driven by anomalous data, that is to say that the result only exists right, when our assumptions are being violated or when certain outliers are being included, then it really isn't much of a finding, and the removal of those outliers is going to be warranted. And we should focus on the, the analysis that does not include those outliers. Because if the result goes away, when the outliers are excluded, it wasn't really much of a result to begin with. And finally, you know, this I can appreciate how it feels a little bit qualitative, and you know, there's a lot of if-then sorts of reasoning that we have to go through in these very contextual judgments. So if you're confused or uncertain of what to do in a certain situation, that's okay. There's not going to be a precise hard cutoff line where we can say if something is greater than the 99th percentile, you need to remove it as an outlier. Uh, and, and we have to exercise a little bit of fuzzy reasoning here to think about when is it most appropriate to include or exclude an outlier, when might it be appropriate to run the analysis both ways ways and see if our analysis is robust. And in research, we're often going to encounter these situations of ambiguity. And in those situations, we should follow in the words of Carl Pearson uh, and put our data on the table. Um, he actually said, put your statistics on the table, but we can say, put your data on the table, with the idea being that we should be as transparent as possible, both in showing our data so that uh, readers and reviewers can make their own judgments and determinations about our assumptions and what the data look like. Um, and then we should also report all of our analyses. Uh, 
as much as possible so that everyone can know, well, how many times did we analyze our data? Did we run it with or without this outlier? What was the actual effect of that outlier on the results? So this will allow, you know, reviewers in the sort of the pre-publication stage to help make some, maybe some recommendations about what would be best in this situation, or what would be an extra test of the robustness of our results to make sure that our result really isn't being driven by some sort of spurious association. And then uh, once it is published, this also allow readers to make their own informed judgments about, well, just, just how much do I really trust this result? If, you know, if this, this, this is a very fleeting finding that goes away or gets significantly weaker, you know, when, when an outlier is removed, maybe I don't trust it very much. But if it's there and if it's present across different analyses and it seems robust to these violations of assumptions, then maybe I put a little more trust in that finding. And I think that is a really real systematic thing that's happening in the data and not just a fluke that's being driven by one or two outliers.